Reverse by Black K Cat. Chapter 34. Deprehend. Kakashi can remember the Naruto from Kanaha, the lonely little boy who tried too hard to be happy and only counted the Hokage as a friend. He can remember the Naruto from Whirlpool, grinning at him from the back of a flying fox. What he can't remember is this. Naruto laughing freely, running across the wet grass with two other children, arms outstretched. Can't remember happiness or such pure joy or that free smile with no shadows in his eyes. Minato's eyes in the sun, warm and blue and so full of life and wonder. Kushina too, hidden away in the angle of his grin, the merry mischief on his face. It feels like a blow to the chest, like a kunai driven into his gut. Kakashi comes to a sharp stop, one hand catching the edge of the gate to study him and can't do anything but stare. Garama pushes past him with a huff, but does a pause. I'm back yet, he calls. Did you brats catch another geezer? Just the same one. Ni Yugito says, a cat please smile on her face as she rounds the corner of the building and comes to a halt. Hot on her heels, Naruto comes flying back into sight looking fit to burst with glee. Kurani, Kurani, can you play with us now? Kakashi expects Kurama to wave him off to offer a the adults need to talk excuse. Instead, Kurama crouches down, letting Naruto barrel right into him and scoops the boy off his feet, tossing him over his shoulder like a sack of rice. I guess I could, he says, pretending reluctance, though Kakashi can see how he's fighting a smile and losing. Oof! Something small and red collides with his leg and he grabs the tiny creature by the back of its shirt and hauls it up, settling it on his hip. Another small child, Kakashi is horrified to see and takes a prudent step back lest he be called out to babysit or... or hold one or something. Karama doesn't even glance at him. Hey, Gara, he says, warm and a good bit softer than the voice he used with Naruto. Staying out of trouble. The Kaze Kage's brat... The one back he called dangerous and unstable and prone to violent outbursts. Gives Garama a sweet, shy smile and curls his arms around the man's neck, laying his head on Garama's shoulder. We played tag. It was fun, he says, muffled and barely translatable. Yeah! Naruto chimes in, happily hanging upside down. Roshi got distracted by Fu's glittery stuff and a branch knocked him down and then Han started laughing at him and they decided to wrestle. Well, Roshi decided to wrestle. Han was laughing so hard he didn't seem to notice. <laughs> so the two oldest Jin Shuriki really did make it here, as the Kage thought. Kakashi would be surprised, except that's just how his luck seems to go. All he can really hope for is that Roshi won't want to continue their fight or hold on to any grudges. He doesn't have the mental fortitude to deal with more than one Jinchuriki at a time out for his blood, and Kurama is dangerous enough on his own. And the house is still standing. Color me astonished. Kurama tickles Naruto's bare feet, making the boy giggle and squirm, and then hitches himself up a little higher and heads for the backyard. Astonished? What color is that? Naruto sounds confused, and he's trying to crane his head around to look at his uncle. Either he hasn't noticed Kakashi and his team yet, or he just doesn't care, and Kakashi isn't sure which option stings more. He has no right to Naruto's attention, not really, but he looks an awful lot like all the best parts of Minato and Kushina. So terrifyingly much like all the things Kakashi has allowed to slip from between his fingers and shatter on the ground. It's just a silly saying, Naruto-chan. Another voice chimes in, and a fourth child, this one with green hair, leaps lightly off the roof, lands, and immediately launches herself at Karama's back, just managing not to completely squish Naruto. Karama grunts theatrically, staggering forward, and Yugito grabs the arm that's supporting Gara like she's going to keep him on his feet. Something wicked sparks at Karama's grin, making Yugito's eyes widen, and with an exaggerated cry, he tips over. Kakashi can recognize the control fall when he sees one, but the kids hanging off of the red head all shriek in gleeful terror as Karama topples to the ground and rolls to pin all four of them with his weight. Karama ni The green haired girl complains loudly, trying to wiggle out from under his right shoulder. No fair Naruto agrees, voice muffled by the curve of Karama's back. You're heavy 
Kakashi notes that of all of them, Gaara looks the least troubled. Then again, he's tucked under Garama's left arm, still in pretty much the same position with his arms around Garama's neck, and it seems like he'd be more than happy to stay there. Yeah, Kakashi is thinking Baki may have missed one or two things about the kid's personality. Are you calling me fat? Garama shoots back, letting a little more of his weight rest on them to a chorus of exaggerated groans. Are you? Brats. Closing the gate behind their group, Zabuza laughs. I could say was that that they are not, he says clearly amused and takes a few faux casual steps forward. What if you want help pinning them down? Yukito squeaks and twists hard, apparently not a fan of this idea. As she staggers to her feet, she gives Zabuza a look that borders on actual evil. Says to Kurama, The geyser is probably trying to yell for you, Kurama. You should come rescue him again. And stalks back around the side of the house. Kurama rolls his eyes, accepting the hand Zabuza offers and letting the swordsman tug him to his feet. He sidesteps Zabuza's cheerful grope of his butt, sweeps the other man's feet out from under him, and scoops up the two six-year-old as Zabuza yelps and goes down. You know, anyone else would think you were joking. He calls after you, Gito, as the green-haired girl scrambles onto his back again. Matatami says you should know better by now. The blonde calls back, and Kakashi could hear something like muffled swearing under the words. Yeah, yeah. Kurama hitches Gara up, boosts Naruto over his shoulder again, and follows muttering about cats under his breath. Well, Chizui says at length, sliding up to stand at Kakashi's elbow. I think we can strike off manipulating them to earn their loyalty from the list of Kurama's misdeeds. I wouldn't even let Sasuke climb all over me like that. Sasuke would be more likely to go for a groin shot. Itachi reminds him pointedly. And you would be more likely to pull his hair. His eyes are softer, though, somehow. Touched with something Kakashi can't quite place. He wonders if this spark has anything to do with Itachi's desire to leave Anbu, but doesn't ask. Sasuke is a brat! She's weak complains, and Kakashi can't believe he doesn't choke on the hypocrisy of that statement. Apparently, neither can Tenzo, because he coughs pointedly. When Shisui glares at him, he just gives a creepy, bland smile in return and says, What was that, Shisui? I couldn't hear you over the sound of your childishness. Shisui sticks his tongue out at him and flips him off, and Tenzo beams back, giving him ghoul eyes that send a shiver down even Kakashi's spine. It is, Kakashi thinks, a rather neat summary of the entirety of their interactions. Children? Don't make the captain send you to your rooms, the 11-year-old in the group says mildly, and Kakashi kind of wants to put his face in his hands. His team. Why? Zabuza, of course, laughs at them as he pushes to his feet. You siblings, or are you just fucking? He asks and snickers at the twin horrified looks that suddenly snap in his direction. Eh, eh, I'm not judging, so people get off on that, like, man... If you finish that sentence, I will tell Amiguri that you implied Kuroichi are naturally weaker. Or may. Nagura says from behind them, as mild as a summer sky, and Zabuza instantly snaps his mouth shut. It makes Kakashi think of Anko's reaction to that statement, and he winces. If May or Amiguri's reaction is anything similar, he understands. Completely. Don't say things like that! Zabuza growls, picking up his sword and slinging it over his shoulder again. The room it could be- Yagura rolls his eyes. If she hasn't left, he says dismissively, she's probably wherever Roshi is, throwing herself at the poor man. I am not! The main door flies open and an auburn-haired woman in a blue dress stalks down the steps. Keep your slander to yourself, shrimp! And L is here if you can tear yourself away from your new hero long enough to meet with him. I'm not hero worshipping Kurama, you harpy! Yagura retorts, eyes narrowing. May, it looks like he just handed her a gift. I never mentioned Kurama, did I? She asks gleefully. Funny that your mind should jump right to him, Yagura. I hope you get left at the altar, Yagura hisses, and die all alone with ten cats. The Konoichi screeches in fury, lunging like she's going to strangle him, and Kakashi rapidly decides it's time to relocate. He ducks flailing limbs and double times it after Kurama, Zabuza, who apparently has the same idea, keeps pace. Swear I miss him being brainwashed, 
the swordsman mutters, casting a wary eye behind them. I could handle Torumi being sad and resigned about killing our best friend. This is what terrible. Kakashi can't say he disagrees. Though now that he thinks about it, and he would kindly like his brain to stop, actually, there are definitely parallels between Mei and Yagura's interactions and Tenzo and Chisley's, no matter how much he wishes he could unsee them. Still, friendship. They're good friends. He doesn't care unless they get in an actual fight and seriously disrupt the team. Kagaji's head may be firmly in the sand, but that's okay. He likes it there. Just around the corner, the muffled swearing Kagaji's been hearing resolves itself into less muffled swearing, coming from a white wrap bundle that's roughly the size and shape of the Toad Sage. Karama is beside the wriggling prisoner, crouched down with the four kids around him and a dark-haired teenager next to him, and he looks amused. Kakashi doesn't really want to know, but he drifts in that direction anyway, because the only other option is the porch. Han and Roshi are sitting on the porch. They're watching him, like hawks. Go on a nail, string him up somewhere. Kagurama is asking when he gets close enough to hear, and where Kakashi has heard most parental figures in this kind of situation sound aggrieved or annoyed, Kagurama sounds faintly proud and very much like he's swallowing laughter. Zabuza's not going to approve. Doesn't fit his decor. You mean, Haku won't approve. Yugi Toko Rex, and there's a stubborn tilt to her chin. You, do we have to let him go? The green egg girl. Taki's Jinchuroki Kakashi is sure, and he remembers the bite marks on the dead Jonin they found with a healthy amount of respect for her scrappiness. Chimes in. He hurt Yugito. And he tried to apologize for it. Yugito says like it's the worst thing that could happen in the aftermath. Kitten, sweetheart, he probably thought it was the right thing. I'm a Konoichi! The blonde girl snaps and then looks horrified that she did. She ducks her head, hands fisting at her sides, and adds in a much quieter tone. Karamani, I'm a Konoichi, and I almost lost a fair fight between us. I don't want him to say sorry for that, but he keeps trying, and he won't stop! With a faint sigh, Karama hooks an arm around Yugito's shoulders and pulls her into a hug. I know, kitten, he says warm and faintly amused. Have you tried telling him that? You get the rolls her eyes at him, but shakes her head and steps back, and Karama lets her go. She looks at the tacky girl, who is apparently her partner in crime in this matter, and gets a carefree smile that has an edgy of teeth to it as an answer. Fine, she allows. Well, let him out. Gara Chan, can you stop coating the wrappings with your sand? The little red-headed boy, still clinging to Karama's shirt, nods seriously and turns his attention on the wriggling bundle. Almost invisible particles slide off, pooling on the ground, and all at once the cloth tears. Jiraiya rips his way through the bindings with murder in his expression. But when his gaze settles on Karama, he pulls up short. You're little brats, Jiraiya starts. Karama ignores him completely. Your control's gotten a lot better, he tells Gara. Good job. Kara buries his face in Karama's side, hiding his pleased flesh and mumbles something that might be a thank you. Karama just chuckles and ruffles his hair, then looks at Naruto, who's crouching next to him. You helped, too. He asks. Yep! Naruto says cheerfully. You get on me, said I could be the distraction! So I made a big bunch of chains and made the geezer think they were gonna grab him! But then, whoo, hit him with her sparkly stuff and you get on me, wrapped him up! We're the best team ever! You definitely are. Karama agrees, tweaking his nose, but Kakashi can hardly hear him over the sound of his heartbeats. Chakra? Chains? Like Kushina's adamantine chains? He'd known they were an Uzumaki clan secret and only possible for those with the largest reserves of chakra, but he hadn't quite made the connection, he supposes. Had it looked at Karama and thought, Uzumaki, and how'd it mean all the things he should... But now, standing with Naruto, knowing that Jutsu well enough to teach it, Kakashi looks at Karama, and for the first time, he really sees Kushina's brother. It's there in his face, the curve of his cheeks, the shape of his eyes, the angle of his grin. Naruto shares it too, now that he can compare them side by side. Here and now, he can say with absolute certainty that there's no way that they're unrelated. Oh... He thinks and doesn't quite know where to go from there. 
Kurama, Yagura calls and the redhead glances up. Kakashi looks back towards the porch where the Mizukage has joined Roshi and Han and YOU! The blue haired man with an eye patch cries pointing at Cheesby. YOU! Kakashi raises a brow and is subordinate. Cheesby looks absolutely blank for about seven seconds and then his eyes widen. The old guy with the black gun! Oh no! Oh. The Jonin barks. What do you think you're doing to Gary? If you're going to control our Mizukage again! Hagura raises a hand. Oh, he says simply, and the man stops short. Pulling himself up, he turns and bows to the Yodame. Long pulled the cheese Mizukaki Samba, but the last time I encountered him, he laid a Jinjutsu onto my team and would have killed us if we didn't retreat. And knowing what we do about the man who controlled you, having an Uchiha here! Kakashi's brain jumps from that to the Hokage's mention in his letter of Yagura being freed from a Jinjutsu, and from there to his request that the Uchiha keep their Sharingan deactivated, and it makes a horrifying amount of sense, given what the Sharingan is supposed to be able to do to Biju. But it also doesn't, because the last time an Uchiha was declared a missing nin was Madara! Oh, that's enough, Yagura says evenly. Close your mouth. Karama, can we discuss your plans for a moment? Karama looks at the kids gathered around him and sighs. Sure. He calls back, then pushes to his feet. Gara lets go of him with clear reluctance, immediately moving back to Naruto's side, and the tacky girl pouts a little. I thought you were going to play with us, she protests, though it's half-hearted at best. In a few minutes, Karama promises. Just need to hash out a few details. Kakashi, you'll probably want to listen in. Your team, too. Kakashi can't help but wonder how much of that is true and how much is to keep them away from Naruto and safely under Karama's eye. He's not going to protest, though, because Jiraiya is nodding and pulling himself to his feet. About time you got here, the Toad Sage says. I've been keeping these brats entertained for an hour now, and we've got more important things to deal with. These brats have kicked your butt twice now. Karama retorts. He waits for Kakashi and his team to follow Jiraiya towards the house before bringing up the rear. You're just afraid they'll bruise your ego to the point it can't recover. My ego can recover from anything, Jiraiya says with pride. Speaking of which, that lovely redhead is going to learn that you're the one who's been spying on the bathhouse if you make so much as a pass at her. I hear she reacts like Tsunade. Karama finishes for him, burying his teeth in what might be a grin. Then he pauses. Glancing back at the silent teenager still standing with the other children. The boy just smiles. Go ahead, he urges. Saiken and I have agreed that it's best we stay here with the younger Jinchuriki while you go after Akatsuki. I may as well stay with them now, too. The fact that Saiken is sensible is a gift from the sage, Karama says dryly. You definitely got lucky there, Utagata. There's a pause as the boy's eyes lose focus and then he smiles and answers. Saiken says you're his favorite, so he's happy to help. Well, he's my favorite, too. Karama waves a hand as he turns back, narrowing his eyes faintly when he catches Kakashi watching. Kakashi promptly offers his best bullshit smile and waves cheerfully. Coming, Karama? He asks brightly. The redhead rolls his eyes, but as he makes to pass Kakashi, his steps falter. He takes a breath, looks away, and then says roughly, you overreacted. So did I. I just couldn't let you take him from me. Then, as if that's all the emotionality he can stand for the day, he books it towards the porch. Kakashi stares after him, caught completely off guard, and tries to reconcile the bitter, angry man he first met, always on a hair trigger and grieving so clearly that it leached into everything he did. With this man who apologizes sincerely and laughs with the kids he's picked up and is able to make jokes that aren't barbed on both sides. Oh, he thinks again, but can't manage anything else. Because the Karama he met on his mission was a broken, shattered thing, shards just barely held together by willpower and stubbornness. To see him come so far in a few short weeks, to see him healed, and not just superficially, it's not that it means anything, really, because Kakashi is fine, and he's told everyone who has ever asked exactly that. But it's interesting, intellectually, to see someone who's lost everything build something new in its place. Kakashi takes a breath, wishes he hadn't buried his Ichi Ichi at the bottom of his weapons pouch, 
or that he could somehow get to his Anbu mask and follows Kuruma inside. This road trip isn't turning out quite the way we expected. With a roar of pure fury, the woman who was previously after him but not only seems to want to help throws herself at the blue-haired woman who has him wrapped up in paper that won't tear. The blue-haired woman dodges, ducks the massive black dog that comes flying in from the other side and retreats in a hurry from a swarm of rattling insects that land on Bee's paper cocoon and start draining the chakra from it. Got it, Chibi? The Kanaakanoichi shouts, grinning like this is the most fun she's ever had. Affirmative. The hooded shinobi off to the side says he doesn't go after his partner as she launches herself into the surrounding forest following the other Konoichi. Instead, he turns his attention to B, calling his insects back into the gourd on his back and reaching out to rip off the first layer of paper. From deeper in the woods, there's a dog's deep snarl, a woman's angry shout, and the heavy thunder of a tree falling. Shibi glances that way but still doesn't move. Thanks for the save, mate. B manages as soon as his mouth is uncovered. Nah, so cool to be caught when you're on the lamb. The other shinobi is unmoved by the brilliance of his rap. The Hokage and Rikage sent my team to retrieve you. It would be best if you returned to Kanaha with us immediately. No can be, B protests. Got a Jinchuriki reunion to get to, Yahoo! There is an organization of us shrink missing nin after you. Another man sliding out of the shadows. He has one arm clutched to his chest, clearly broken, and is walking with a limp. The hooded Jinobi immediately abandons B, hurrying over to loop an arm around the long-haired man's waist. The newcomer accepts it gratefully, leaning heavily on his partner, and asks, Sume? In the distance, another tree falls with a booming crash, and the hooded man says dryly, Guess. The other Shinobi snorts and looks up at B. His eyes are eerily pale, almost colorless, and B realizes with a start that he's a Huga. You will come back with us, the Huga says, flat and certain. I may hate your brother with every fiber of my being, but I won't fail a mission appointed by the Hokage himself. You don't gotta hate, eh? He might talk tough, but he's a sunshiny ray. B tries, and yes, it's a slight exaggeration, but that's what artistic license is for. The hooded Jinobi winces, and the Hyuga's mouth thins into an angry line. He is responsible for the death of my twin, he snaps. He had my daughter kidnapped and my brother killed, all for our eyes. I have every right to hate him. Shibi, we need to move. Eagle Squad is down to two members. Of all the Hyuga to send after him, B silently curses his brother's luck, because it's certainly not his, and reaches for his own partner. Yuki answers readily, feeding him chakra until it falls over him like a shroud and he twists his body, loosening up. You go deal with a paper check. Me and Yuki have six other asses to kick. The Yuga snarls something that really doesn't suit a glant head, or at least not the one B has met. But when he takes a step towards B, the other Kanaashinobi pulls him back. We can't run, Hiyashi. Chibi says firmly. They will chase us, and we will lose what advantage we have. Iyashi takes a breath, closes his eyes, and then opens them again. They all have exactly the same chakra signature, he tells me. I assume there's some way for them to share a line of sight, given the way they move. Be careful. They killed three Anbu in a handful of minutes, and they seem entirely prepared to face a Jinjuriki. Thanks to you, we got it now, B says, offering him a salute. We'll beat him up and take him out. The Yuga nods, grits his teeth, and pulls himself upright. We'll come for you as soon as Sumi's opponent is dealt with. Hold them off until then. Without waiting for an answer, he steps away from Shibi still limping faintly and hurries into the trees. Shibi gives B one last nod before he follows swiftly. There's movement in the darkness behind him, and B turns sharply to face the man standing beside the wide trunk. Orange hair, heavy piercings, ringed purple eyes. Is the man who first attacked him out of nowhere. Got a name other than fool? Attacking beast time is just not go. Cool. B says accusingly. The man doesn't move beyond a faint tip of his head. I'm going to create a new world. He says, and his gaze doesn't waver from B's. And for that, I need you. Or rather, the tailed beast inside of you. One man here means the other five have to be close by. B hopes they didn't go after the Kanaha team, but judging by the fact that the attacker is here and the Anmu team is nowhere to be found, the odds of them leaving bystanders alive isn't good. 
And given the way Yugito's teachers were killed, almost like an afterthought, you're the ones that attack little Yugito, B realizes. That's just not cool, yo. The man remains unmoved. The newbie escaped me, but it doesn't matter. I'll be taking you. There's a click, a hiss, and B spins just in time to see three rockets come flying from the trees headed straight for him. He ducks to the side, leaps back and away, and they strike the ground where he was standing, exploding with a thunderous boom and filling the air with smoke and rubble. B lands further back, bracing himself, and feeds even more of Yugi's chakra into the cloak. He's completely confident in his own powers, but six against one isn't exactly good odds, even for Agent Chiriki. The smoke whirls, shifts, and parts. The five strange shinobi step through perfectly in sync, and B remembers Hiyashi's warning about shared sight. He steps back, then sets his feet and holds his ground. The pale, transparent chakra surrounding him bleeds black-red, covering him completely, and the first man, he smiles. Ah, uh, he says and walks forward, taking his place with the other five. Now that's the power we seek. A tip of his head, a flick of his hand, and he orders, go. They move as one, swift and eerily silent, and B only has time to bring up his fists before the first one is closing in.